Oh, thank you. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> I get it. Say, got it. Uh, thank you so much for joining today's session of the UVM Foundation's Leadership Speaker Series. My name is Debbie McInerney, and I'm the chair of the foundation's board. Um, I have the pleasure of hosting you today. Um, and the purpose of the series is to showcase the impact that UVM has on the lives of our students, on communities, and on the world, thanks to our donors. And so much of what UVM is able to accomplish is driven by the dedicated support of our volunteers. It's important that we provide every opportunity to all of you to learn about the inspiring, impactful stories that this support makes possible. So we hope you feel proud about your part in advancing UVM. And if you're inspired to learn more about today's topic, please let me or Brian know and we can connect you. Um, a couple of housekeeping matters before we start. Um, I'm gonna ask you to please stay muted for the duration of Dr. First talk. Um, he's going to give a talk, but we are going to open it up to questions. So save your questions, jot them down. We want to hear from you. Um, feel free to type your comments and questions into the chat, or when the moment comes, use um, the raise hand feature on the Zoom, um, and we will try to get to just as many of you as possible. Um, you will receive a follow-up message. Um, from today's speaker series, which you can watch. This is being recorded, so you can watch again. You can share the recording with your friends. And um, um, if there are any topics that you're interested in for the future, please let us know and we'll try to the right um, So without further delay, today, I am honored, honored to welcome a distinguished leader in the field of pediatrics. Dr. Lewis First. Dr. First received his bachelor's degree, med degree, and a master's degree in epidemiology from Harvard University. Following his residency at Boston Children's Hospital and a fellowship in ambulatory pediatrics, he assumed the role of professor and chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Vermont's College of Medicine in 1994. And we were thrilled to have him. <laughs> As he enters his 13th, uh, 30th year in this role, sorry, I was cutting that way short on you. Um, he also serves as the chief of pediatrics at the University of Vermont Children's Hospital. From 2008, I mean, 2003 to 2008, Dr. First played a pivotal role as a senior associate dean for medical education, contributing to the development of the Vermont integrated curriculum. Since 2009, he has held the position of editor in chief of the American Academy of Pediatrics peer reviewed journal creatively called Pediatrics. Um, Dr. First is a recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the AAMC's Robert Blazier Distinguished Teacher Award, the AAP's National Medical Education Award, the Miller Sarkin Mentoring Award, and the Holroyd Sherry Award for contributions to children's health through me. He was honored with the Joseph W. Jim Junior Leadership Award in 2018, and in 2017, he received the George B. Hunter Outstanding Faculty Award from the University of Vermont Alumni Association. Named Chair Emeritus and Honorary Member for Life of the National Board of Medical Examiners in 2019, Dr. First was also selected into the inaugural cohort of the National Academy of Distinguished Educators in Pediatrics in 2020. A prolific author, Dr. First was Published, has published dozens of peer-reviewed articles and co-edited five textbooks beyond academia. He provides medical advice through First with Kids on radio, television, and community newspapers throughout Vermont. 
Dr. First commitment to addressing healthcare disparities and promoting equity for all children earned him the 2021 Lifetime Student Award for the Medicare a group dedicated to improving the health of at risk children and their families in Vermont. We are fortunate, so, so lucky to host a speaker with such depth of experience and dedication to his field. And without further delay, let me introduce Dr. First. Over to you. Thank you, Debbie. I think everybody can hear me. Yes. Well, okay. Let me uh, just beam up here for one second and we'll get going. Everybody has a little title slide there. Get a nod. Perfect. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I would just say, wow, which upside down, all of you in pediatrics know is mom. But I have, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity over the next several minutes to share with you a little bit about how our department in Children's Hospital truly have been and are nurturing the lives of children here at the University of Vermont. So to get started, I want to have some objectives. I, as a teacher, objectives are always important. And three came up right away of what I think we can do over the minutes that we have together. First of all, I want to update you on where we've been, where we are, and where we need to be as we look to the future of children's health here at the university. I want to validate with you how we are achieving our mission and vision in ways that are truly nurturing the lives of infants, children, and teenagers, and make clear the important role that philanthropy has played in what we have been and are now able to achieve. And look at that spells. I mean, coincidence, I spent all night on this slide. Look, UV, what are the odds of that? But to get started to achieve these objectives, I want to start with a salute to the number 73. Now, there's a number that you probably don't give enough credit to. It, 73, for example, if you're a math fan, is the smallest number with 12 letters in its name, if you spell it out, and it happens to be the 12th prime number. There's another coincidence. It's the atomic number of, I'm sure, your favorite element, tantalum. It was Sheldon Cooper's favorite number, this is absolutely true, in the Big Bang Theory when that aired on television. And it is our 73rd year as a Department of Pediatrics and a Children's Hospital here at the University of so 73 years, and there have been only three department chairs in the 73 years that have made this department what it is. Jim McKay founded this department in 1950, 33 years as chair. Lee Phillips, 10 years as chair. And needless to say, you can do the math and figure out, as you just heard, I'm rounding into year number 30. So why does this happen when the average turnover, I'm on the new chairs committee, happens to be four years for a pediatric chair? Why is that? Well, because Jim McKay came up with a mission that has lasted, it's sort of part of a secret sauce that I want to share with many of you who don't know a lot about us, and some of you do, and I think you'll attest to the fact that, and I'm going to move some slides, you know, highlight some things. So if slides move, um, I'm not going to go deep. I just want to give you a feel for some of the things that are going on. But our mission is to improve the health of children right here in our region, okay, in this part of the country, in Vermont, upstate New York, through all of the proverbial uh, legs of the academic stool, clinical research, educational, and advocacy, where it makes a difference first for those we serve, and then we can share it throughout the country and then the world. Our vision, because we're not a freestanding children's hospital, is to be a children's hospital without walls. I'll show you how that comes to be. And that means everybody can come in the tent that utilizes the talents of everyone who really shares an interest in improving the health and well being of children. And within the past several years, we also live and breathe and act, not just talk, by a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement that certainly aligns with the university, but it's something that we hold front and center, and I'll say more about this. In terms of here are some key words in this statement, and there's a strategic plan that goes with it. We're compassionate, collaborative. We focus on diversity, inclusiveness, cultural humility. We're in an environment here free from bias and discrimination. This has been so important to remind each of us, particularly with things going on in Burlington and around the world right now. And we reduce barriers to health equity for all children and families. Now, for those of you who don't know who we are, before I get into how we're achieving that nurturing of children, I'll give you a quick primer. We are a children's hospital. We are a full service children's hospital. There are about 85 medical, actually, medical faculty in Burlington in our health network, closer to a little bit over 100. There are, as you'll see in a moment, about 160 
plus pediatricians here in the state of Vermont. But there are very few things we don't do. We don't do heart surgery because it doesn't make sense to have that team for the number of cases we would do. We don't do bone marrow transplants or stem cell transplants. And we don't do a type of critical care called that involves something called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO, because again, you need a team. And that's where we go to those coordinary areas. But otherwise, we are an accredited full service children's hospital. And I feel fortunate that we can provide all of these services. We serve, as I said, there's about 160 pediatricians in the great state of Vermont and um, also uh, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> practice provide, I was going to say, associate practice provide the nurse practitioners and the PAs um, who join us. Two thirds are in, um, are in what's called the UVM Health Network. And 85 of these 150 are sitting around Chittenden County, Addison County and Franklin County. Uh, we have a coast of nurses which are, which are critical to our well-being and about 50 staff. We serve about 225,000 um, children in this region. You can see our office, our numbers, our quantitative numbers. Our patient satisfaction ratings are exceedingly high. And we provide, and I'll come back to this phrase, high-quality, child-friendly, family-centered care. Um, this is what I want you to think about, though. We are the only providers of secondary means subspecialty care and of intensive care in Vermont and in upstate New York. Our closest neighbors are Albany and Dartmouth down in the South. So this allows us to focus on the kids. We're not competing unless in quality, we do compete nationally, but in the sense that we have to be here for these children and we have to do it right. So when we talk about the University of Vermont Health Network, you would say we are a children's hospital in Burlington, but now we are a children's hospital without walls. So here you can see, here's primary care, our subspecialty, and here's acute and inpatient care. And below that, you see other hospitals that are in Vermont that are part of our network. And it's wonderful because the goal here is that we make sure that the quality of care to any child, even in Malone, New York, oops, we got an echo there, in Middlebury or in central Vermont are getting the same quality through our vice chairs and our structure um, as a child who's getting their care here in Burlington. To give you an example, these are pictures taken over in Plattsburgh, where we have hospitalists, doctors who are there to take care of newborns, inpatients, um, in the ED, et cetera. And when they have a baby born where we need to go get that baby or they're worried, we have cameras on them from the get-go. We can even put a camera down the baby's throat to make sure that we are providing state-of-the-art care in Plattsburgh to keep that baby safe and decide whether or not we need to transport them back to Burlington. So that's a quick primer about the quantity of who we are. Now, I gave you the mission and the vision, but I really need to say that over the years that I have been here, um, six tenants came up. They, they began when actually um, I, I left Boston, and I tell the story that these were wonderful people who put me in a room and said, you know, if you go to Vermont, and I love the people in Boston, Debbie, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, you realize that could be the end of your academic career. And I said, well, you may never hear from me again, but you're gonna hear from the people that make our department and children's hospital special. And so with that, six tenants came up and I'm gonna share them with you because through these six tenants of the scaffolding of what makes us who we are, you'll see how we're nurturing the lives of children. So I'm gonna start by showing, and this is not in any particular order except perhaps the last one, but the faculty that we hire here um, need to be, when I come on board, want to be national or international leaders in what they do. So needless to say, all I'm going to say is these are the logos of the leading uh, educational research and advocacy organizations in the United States. Um, we have faculty that are on boards, leading, been former presidents. Buzz Landier, he was the former chair of the American Board of Pediatrics, which is up there in the upper right. I mean, we've got lots, lots and lots of national leadership, which connects us to the rest of the world. Yesterday, it was wonderful to see uh, graduates of our program get their fellowships at Boston Children's, Utah, and University of Pittsburgh, because again, people know we are here and we are sending our graduates out. Many of them will come back. So let's talk about national and education. We are playing a leadership role through those logos in the education of our students first, our residents, our staff, our nurses, okay, and then our community but then we're teaching the rest of the country and the world what we're doing. We've provided innovations in curriculum. We've, we've designed simulation, active learning, how we do uh, the two month, four month and six month checkups. There's a book called Bright Futures that's basically the Bible of the American Academy of Pediatrics. The three editors in chief came from here. 
Um, I can go on. And we even the fourth year boot camp, we started a program to train fourth year medical students how to get ready for their residency when they finish medical school, putting them for two weeks. This is a labor of love. And now we are the boot camp gurus for the United States, showing other places around the country how to get their students ready to become residents. We are national leaders. I, I edit pediatrics before I did this. Jerry Lucy, for some of you may know, was editor of that journal for 33 years. We offer textbooks, curriculum, and many of us are writing the exams that certify physicians in the United States. And we get it right in our community. We use our website. We use mainstream media. We use social media to get our discoveries out to our community so they understand what we understand. I'm just going to go through this. When I say our education and it you know, many people say, I don't have time to teach. This is literally a hundred and some odd names of our faculty, our nurses and our staff who are making the courses that we offer to our students and interprofessional courses all happen because teaching is first front and center for the future of who's gonna take care of kids in this area. As a result, we get recognized. We have numerous awards that come to us. Last year in the teaching honors that come from our teaching academy, they give five awards. One went to my vice chair for education who designed the boot camp program. Our entire curriculum and strategic plan on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I'll talk more about, Dr. Farisi got honored. We have teachers of the year, humanism awards of the year, honor societies, accolades from students, all of the, I don't wanna, but point is because we do this, the rest of the country says, can we learn from you? And we've been runner up this year for clinical. We've either been the winner or runner up since I've been here. Here are some recent accolades that came off from the recent, we get these, you know, students don't only say what's wrong, but they tell us what's right. Um, you can read these for yourself, but you can see a supportive faculty, a tight knit community, the environment and culture were warm, welcoming and fun. Think about where medicine is right now. Every single, but here it's different. Here we look at pediatrics as not a job or a career, but it's a calling and we're honored to be in it. The students pick up on that. The department at UVM goes above and beyond. These are quotes from our students offering incredible advising, teaching and hands-on experience. Let's take a brief look at research, if we could. In the research arena, just to sort of show you for a second, this is just from last year to this year, uh, actually goes through 20, uh, 22, our grants from 21 to 22 are up about $1.6 million, 56 projects going on. I have 85 faculty on this campus who have those 56 projects coming from the NIH. You can see what these projects are, which are real. Taking kids with medical complexity and making their trip to the emergency room easier. OK, standardizing how we breathe for babies and using not only our telementoring work that we do at hospitals here in Vermont, but now we're taking it to Africa and we're telementoring over in Ethiopia and Uganda. And then we're talking about how do we educate providers to talk to um, teenagers and kids who identify with uh, on the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. So we've gotten grants there. This is one of our residents who's going to Pittsburgh to do his adolescent fellowship, Ben Kim. Last year, with 85 of us, we put out 85, 87 papers involving 65 faculty, other residents, nurses, et cetera, while we're all seeing patients. We were in the new and first paper at the top here was New England Journal. It's a headliner, Leslie Young, for the work we've done with babies born to mothers who used opioids. We have revamped how we see these babies, care for them, and basically we're taking this around the country. The other journals here are from pediatrics, from cancer, from a variety of ones that basically we are in significant peer review journals telling our story. We're also doing neonatology all over the world. 1,400 neonatal intensive care units send us their data each and every day from 38 countries, and that helps the babies here so we can provide state-of-the-art child-friendly, family-centered care, learning from the rest of the world. These are the four leaders. This was started by Jerry Lucy. Here we are in Ethiopia. We just started in the past year something. We started the Ethiopian Needle Natal, Needle Natal Network. We now are doing the African Neonatal Network starting in five countries. This has received Gates funding. Uh, and again, is mixing our faculty with the faculty in these African countries to truly allow babies to survive and thrive in lower and middle income parts of the world. Dr. Danielle Eret is our recipient over the past year of our first from the Vermont Oxford Network. They were the generous donors to allow us to create a green and gold professorship in global health for the work she's doing in Africa, named for Asfo Yemeru, a humanitarian in Ethiopia, not a doctor or nurse, but someone who befriended children who basically had major social 
um, drivers or influencers of health that put them in a bad strait. And he, he took them upstream. And that's what Dr. Eret is doing. We do the same thing in Vermont. So we have 1,400 neonatal intensive care units. Every practice in Vermont and a host of family medicine practices as well, every pediatric practice, are hooked into a network called the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program under the leadership of Dr. Rachel Garfield. What is it? It's basically a population. We're in offices all over the state saying, how do we make the care better? It's a quality improvement program that basically aligns us with the Department of Health and says, let's make the outcomes in this state best in the country. We provide quality and quality improvement expertise to teams all over the state in every office. And now we are in 22 states modeling the VCHIP program to allow other states to learn how to get their offices to improve their quality. Uh, and we're doing research all along the way. These are the little places in Vermont where we have CHAMP stands for Child Health Advances maintained in practice. Um, and I said, this is our physicians and our advanced, I blanked on AP, advanced practice providers, our nurse practitioners and PAs are all working together collaboratively in the CHAMP program. And they send, do projects. We're working with, we bring in our adolescents who are part, this is a group where we have recommendations from the teens in this state for how we can keep teens with positive, feeling good about themselves, the Youth Health Improvement Initiative. Perinatally, wherever a baby is born in this state, we have care pathways in place to improve the quality of the way they're being delivered and cared for. When kids are in adolescence going to young adulthood, they fall off. Well, we now have them using their smartphones to make sure they know what to do for their diabetes or their chronic illness when they go under the care of an adult and leave the pediatric auspices, so to speak. And we're very proud with the mental health issues that are going on in kids today, particularly after the pandemic. The VCHIP program is training all the offices on how to do assessments, detailed assessments to identify kids on the autism spectrum so they don't have to wait one, two, three years for the specialist to get to them. They're taking up these particular testing pieces themselves. We work with the payers to get reimbursement. And now this is reducing the wait lines and getting kids plugged into early intervention sooner than later. Okay, this is the little engine that could of the 85 of us pulling this off. In research, as a result, we get lauded. Last year, the medical school as a research week. They give out five or six awards. The mid-career investigator and the junior investigator both went to faculty in our department for work they are doing, one in the VCHA program, Dr. Harder, the other in oncology and cancer. Nationally, we get awards. Dr. Pulcini, the third picture here, was named basically young investigator, came here within two years, had an NIH grant in our emergency department. It's a pediatric emergency physician. Leslie Young, who had that article. New England Journal was runner up for essentially young investigator at the NIH for the work she is doing as the trailblazer for the country. And then again, we have a, a, an alignment with the New England states to identify individuals who have promising research careers. Again, one of our hospitalists, Dr. Cifredi, is their research scholar this year. And we also have innovation awards in honor of Jerry Lucy given to students and residents across disciplines as well as to junior faculty for their innovations. Jerry Lucy loved innovation, and these are very prestigious awards that are in there. Again, we're in year three or uh, three, four of these awards, but people take them exceedingly seriously and the innovations go further. And I think they're gonna seed the world, we'll see. Number two, so we got the national international. Everybody here needs to think about that and get there and we offer advising, mentoring, et cetera. The next thing I wanna show you is everybody here needs to be involved in community service. I don't think people in the state know I edit pediatrics, but I think people do know I'm on the country music radio station, WOK, I'm on television. I was a safety officer for the Little League. This just gives you a sampling this year of the community organizations that we are involved with in partnership and collaboration. We have to be out there with our community. And this is a wellness piece. We love working with these groups. So, and it doesn't have to be with kids. It can be with senior citizens. It can be with food shelves. It can be playing in orchestras, performing in theater, but we are embedded in this community. The third thing we do is that everybody needs to love taking care of children. This is, this is critical to who we are and what we do. And you notice it says the highest quality, cost-effective, child-friendly, family-centered care possible. So let me just tell you, if you don't know what family-centered care is, it means this is not ceremonial. It means patients and families are integrated into everything we do. They're valued, they share, they participate, they collaborate. We have 65 diverse family members from teenagers to members representing and they get involved in our advocacy councils, our nursing councils, our quality improvement projects and our capital improvement projects. We, you know, it's not what I want. 
It's together. What do we want for our children so they have a voice? They do real projects, real outcome. I can tell you one of the things our advisors do is they interview our candidates for our residency. We had this year about 650 candidates from, I think, all 50 states looking for our seven spots. We compete against those institutions, Debbie, in, Berlin, in Boston. Okay, So when we lose somebody, it's to, it's, to the big, it's to the majors. But what we love is, for example, our families interview our candidates for residency. We're the only program in the country that has our applicants being interviewed by our families to say, do you understand what family-centered care is? And they do other projects you can see here. I'll show you a couple of them. They have created, we have a center downtown in the Munt Family Center where our new American families, who are some of our advisors, have created an on-site medical home for the families that come to us from countries all over the world where we don't just do the medicine. We take care of housing. We take care of food security. This has been a remarkable program that we couldn't do without our family advisors. The Empower program is something that came up with advisors, our nurses on bare, uh, on our inpatient floor, our child life team. And what it work, does is when a child gets admitted, they're basically asked, does your child have a challenge, a disability? And then they're asked seven questions. What kinds of textures do they like? What kind of feel? What kind of music, et cetera? So we can cater that room to the needs of that child and empower that family to say, just because you're being admitted doesn't mean we don't know you're special. That comes from our advisors. What about quality? Quality is embedded in everything we do. The quality of our inpatient, it's, it's in everything we do. So I'm going through this to say we are continuously improving our quality, expanding our quality. And this is not about one or two people and promoting quality in everything we do with the fact that all members of our children's hospital practice quality improvement science. We do it with equity. We do it with joy. And we do it with our family advisors right there to make sure that this is making the patient experience even better. These are the four champions who spearhead us across our system. Okay. And we, when we do a project, any project, we start with 10 quality improvement frameworks, okay? If we set this project going, will we be happy? Will it pe patients feel valued? Will they be happy? Um, is it interprofessional? Is it equitable? Is it efficient? Let me show you a couple things on this graph to say, how do we know it works? Intensive care. This is a graph of outcomes of intensive care units that have we have pretty high acuity. This y-axis here is mortality. The x-axis that you see here is length of stay. What you want to do is have shortest length of stay using resources with lowest mortality. That's what's going on in our intensive care unit right now for the country. We're in that box. Here's a graph showing you, in, you know, primary bloodstream infections from 2021 to 2023, and it's flat at zero. This is where the rest of the country said, what are you doing? to get nobody to get infected with the equipment that's inside the vessels of our children. This is a remarkable outcome. Now we did have a breakthrough since I put this slide together and we're attacking it just like we would with anything else, but it's still a remarkable number that we share that with the rest of the country. Here's cystic fibrosis. So this is every center in the United States that does cystic fibrosis. We're a CF center, we're a small one, and they rate you, you get a report card. So this particular one takes a look at body mass index. We need to keep these kids healthy to keep them out of the hospital. We're top 10. The red bar is Vermont. We're top 10. This is cystic fibrosis for breathing. These are for the teenagers and young adults that we transition over, top 10. Here's the teenagers, 13 to 17, top two in the country, okay? And so when you see how are our kids doing in Vermont and upstate New York with cystic fibrosis, you want to be in a box that shows you've got reasonable weight on board and you're breathing well. And this is our X in the far right corner showing some pretty remarkable outcomes. You're probably going to say, how did you handle the pandemic? So I'm going to take you back just for a quick snapshot because we attacked this and the outcomes speak for themselves in this state for children. As soon as we saw this was going on, we formed a task force. We met every day, sometimes twice a day. We brought in quality methodology. We huddled with all of our floors, our outpatient units. And then we decided not only do we have a backup plan to a backup plan of what would happen if we got sick, but we also started to share what we were doing with every practice in the state of Vermont that see our kids, family medicine, pediatrics, and in New York. And people wanted to join us on those calls. We did four calls a week at lunch hour, just like this. And we're still doing a call a month because this group is, we call it sort of Vermont Pediatric Nation. It was started by VCHIP and now the Vermont Medical Society and the Department of Health. And we had during this whole time, no one on our care teams transmitted or got COVID at that particular point. This is how we attack a project. 
This is when we wanted to return and open up our offices. We did something called the key driver diagram. We set a primary, we did quality improvement science. There are those indicators. We measured it all, we opened our offices. The phone calls, Dr. Wendy Davis and Dr. Brina Holmes were at the microphones, but behind it was a team of VCHIP staff who are unsung heroes. To date, we now have over 250 calls, 1,800 unique people on the calls, and we're probably closer to 22,000 people who have heard us and come and get their care. Every care plan during the pandemic went to every office. We talked physicians and nurses off the ledge in the sense of saying it's going to be okay. We're going to anything we're doing in Burlington, we want to share with you. We set up vaccine clinics all over the state and we taught pediatricians, not me, how to talk to families in their community to get them immunized against COVID. We worked with all the schools through those phone calls. We worked on our the mental health of our kids and ourselves. We took we took a look at when there were formula shortages, how do we share around the state and a myriad of other issues, which is why we're still meeting. We took our educational materials with the Department of Health and said we need to make the literacy level nice and easy to do. And then because we have citizens who are new Americans, we translated them, okay? Gave them to the Department of Health for this and we made videos of how to wear a mask, okay? How to wash your hands to keep people safe from across, again, with equity. We used social media and mainstream media to get the information out. That's my little segment there on first with kids to say, here's how we can teach you, you know, again, how to how to feel good about taking care of your child during the pandemic. We went overseas internationally. This is Bill Roscoe on the left talking in Istanbul, Turkey from his office because of he wrote a whole editorial on how schools what schools should do to stay calm. So he he talked to school people all over the world. This is Dr. Rebecca Bell over on the right here talking to the to the Newcaster. She is the head of our American Academy of Pediatrics. She is a leader in our intensive care unit team, and she is now the head of the Vermont Medical Society in charge of all physicians in the state this year because of her advocacy during the pandemic and for many things after that. Even Vermont Medicine, our alumni magazine during the, you know, this is an issue that four out of the five stories were about our children's hospital and our Department of Pediatrics because of what we're trying to do. Number four, and I'll try and speak up a little bit, is just, this is an important one though. Everybody in this department does not just talk, but walks issues in terms of what we do in equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice. Over the past year, just the past year, we have been to Montpelier, we have been down to Washington DC with our medical students to teach them how to advocate on issues of firearm, reproductive and gender affirming care, vaping, getting the flavoring out, mental health, you can see it all here. Our child abuse program, our child safe program has created educational materials to keep kids healthy, to work on positive childhood experiences, not just the adverse ones and provide tools to everyone in to counseling on some tough cases. We have our advocates nationally. The American Academy of Pediatrics has our faculty on the board of directors. Okay, The Vermont Medical Society is now being run by a pediatrician. And these individuals you see are running sections nationally of the American Academy of Pediatrics for their advocacy from global health to genetics. And they get lauded. The highest award the Vermont Medical Society gives last year went to our own Dr. Wendy Davis, okay, who is a pioneer and on the board of the Academy. This year, Becca got that. She also got the School Nurse Champion Award. She is now the president as of last month of the Vermont Medical Society. And she also won the Burlington May Story. Ask her to tell a story. That would be a great seminar. Bring her on to tell you a story. She's great. We have lots of achievement awards. Dr. Coleman practiced in Burlington for 33 years. She got a national award for how she brought quality, compassionate care to the children that she cared for. And Dr. O'Reilly, who runs our neonatal intensive care unit, has been a pioneer for the leadership she's brought in diversity, equity, inclusion. And we even have a faculty member who got so excited working over in Plattsburgh, he's running for office for the Plattsburgh School Board. Okay, so pediatrics is getting a little political. This was the statement we merged and we put together and brought in as well the medical society, emergency family physicians, psychiatrists to make sure that we can be a safe state for reproductive health and transgender care. We also bonded with Camp Outright, which is the organization for the LGBTQIA plus community. We got accepted. We were invited to serve as counselors at a camp for youth who identify on that, on that, as in that group. And the result is the campers repeatedly were heard saying, you're a doctor? No way. And so with that, we were brought into Outright Vermont because they trust us and we learned so much from them. And with that, we have spawned a number of programs and collaboration that goes beyond camp to truly, again, educate our physicians on what youth wanna hear 
so they feel safe when they come to see us if they have you know if they're all across the the gender fluidity their gender identity and their sexual orientation in terms of dei activities diversity equity inclusion basically we have been for three years plus and i wish it had been longer we have every month as a faculty been educating ourselves, largely non-Hispanic white faculty, teaching ourselves. We certainly have diverse faculty, but we don't ask them to teach us. We teach – They. this is on us to say what does it mean to be anti-racist or to be a gender ally. Every one of our presentations, as I'm doing here, has to have an equity slide, have to talk about it. Every project has an equity pause with our families. Who's not in this meeting? What group might be ex – You know, are we excluding somebody? We have health equity rounds that are being set up quarterly with community organizations where we're making changes in our city. We have a new global health curriculum for our residents that, again, deals with the fact this is in three years, the year of the infant, the year of the child, the year of the adolescent, that's teaching our residents, whether they go overseas or not, that local is global. And if we don't understand the problems of the world, we're not doing our job as pediatricians. And we invite national leaders like Dr. Joe Wright, who's the senior vice president for the American Academy of Pediatrics for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, came here last June as our Narkowitz professor in honor of the late Dick Narkowitz. And he basically is now using Vermont as an exemplar for ways that departments and children's hospitals are basically you know, not just talking DEI, but walking it. And we have pathways. I'm going to say and before that, these used to be called pipelines. But from an indigenous nation standpoint, that's a bad word. We don't use that. So our pipeline programs have become pathway programs to take undergraduates, graduate students, high school students, and essentially move them forward to understand what's it mean to be a nurse or a doctor when they never thought they could. So our faculty volunteer their time and basically suture themselves to undergraduates for the year. The result is we get quotes from our – these people are now matriculating into our medical school, and they'll say, this was the most helpful program I've ever experienced to work with attendings who took the time to teach me. Okay, And they're interested – this is about our pipeline, our, our pathway program, excuse me, to say the workforce in pediatrics right now is not strong. And so we're hoping that the diversity of who our children are will be reflected by who our providers are through programs like the – this was created by a medical student and one of our faculty – um, it's our pathway to pediatrics, our underrepresented in medicine pathway to pediatrics, where we've expanded it, not just undergraduates, but high school students who are spending a day with us in April to, to basically meet people who have lived experiences and say, you can do this, be a nurse, be a doctor, be a respiratory therapist. Um, this is Martha Harold, who's now in our year-long program, who was in this program two years and came back and said she this lit a torch for her. It was such an encouragement. She allows us to use the slide. She says it was life altering. I left that day confident that I could be successful. It gave me mentors who could advise me a year later and stay with me. And on she goes. This is a grant we just got to provide mentorship to nurses and physicians who self-identify as underrepresented in medicine and can help others who are coming through the pathways to know they can do this. And so this has been funded again through the UVM Health Network to make this happen. This is Anisha Ramal and Miller Celestin. In gender equity, we show everything in this department. So every year in December, we put up everybody's, you know, everybody knows that there is gender equity and salary and academic rank. We have workshops to move people forward and get them promoted. Two thirds of my faculty are women, which is the demographics of pediatrics. So we wanna make sure there's room to go. We have mentoring and sponsoring. Sponsoring is when you think of someone when they're not in the room and get them opportunities to speak. Instead of asking me to speak, I'll always say, I have somebody who's even better than me. Um, we establish, um, every process, when I want to appoint somebody, there's a process so it's fair and transparent, not I like you, I want to make you my vice chair. And this year, we're the second program in the country to set term limits for leadership, to allow the people in our department to advance and stay here. I'm as focused on retention and retirement and making and doing it with dignity as I am in terms of recruiting these people who are going to be national leaders. So now – People have term limits in many of our leadership positions, so it opens the door for other people to grow in our department. Number five is wellness. Everybody, everybody has to appreciate and practice wellness. We do a host of activities. We have Food Fridays. Every time a month block ends and our residents and student rotate, we celebrate. We have reflective moments twice a month where nurses, die, we go in rooms. We're have, there's one this afternoon when things do not go in a way that perhaps we had hoped would happen for a child or we lose a child, we this hurts. And so we need the time to pull over and hug and, and be together. And it's a wellness piece. 
We have all of our residents in pediatrics have buddies who are in psychology and psychiatry so that mental health can be transferred, not just to those who do mental health, but to pediatricians and understand what they have to do to recognize depression and anxiety. And every one of our residents automatically gets a, a counselor when they come in and they have to opt out. They all use it to help deal with stress and the other experiences of being a doctor that nowadays, which is a key focus on wellness, and they even give them time to breathe. We have something very special here called our ALS competition, which stands for our wellness and lifestyle, where every month the chief resident gives doctors, nurses, students, trainees, you get in a house if you want to join us. Uh, I'm the head of First Indoor, um, and we are given 12 tasks to take selfies for. It could be go to your dentist, try a new restaurant, go out and ski. And we have thousands of these pictures. You see these faces. This is who we are in the midst of this. This is keeping our head above water. This is part of why we are, well, our, our floors do this. These are interprofessional boards. This is from our inpatient service. That board turns over about every two weeks because we get too many of these posted. Thanking and using appreciative gratitude to say thank you. Even our Zoom meetings, our cameras are almost always on which is great. And this was one where I said, show us your favorite artwork as your background. So I'll find creative things to do. And finally, and last but not least, a uh, very important, that is sustainability. Sustainability is critical to making that mission that Jim McKay started with 73 years ago. And to make sustainability happens, I'm finally gonna say the P word, philanthropy. So what about philanthropy? First of all, we do a heck of a lot of friend raising. Last year, and I want to salute everybody from the foundation team and our development team who helped us and helped this community bring together and put $1.1 million of what I call friend raising because this, these dollars are used for programs that don't pay for themselves. Our undergraduates at UVM started a dance marathon several years ago. It's not like one that, you know, this is something they now work on year round, but in literally 12 hours, they raise up 102,000 from college students. It's remarkable. This is something called the Big Change Roundup, where the country music station gets their listeners to collect spare change. And they bring it in over three days. We're on the air. It's the sound of a bunch of us crying on the air. And uh, at the end of that, you can see this year, 279,000 and change. This is, a, this, is a, this is something called Extra Life, where people actually, adults and kids, this is Noah Cohen, one of our, we pick a child each year who exemplifies what a champion is all about. He's a former, will always be a champion, but he was passionate about Extra Life. And uh, this year, Extra Life, the 70, actually we just had, we're waiting for the total, but 70,000 last year. Basically, I went over to the mall, there were a whole rooms of adults playing video games for 12 hours in a way that we're helping the children's hospital. If that's what video games can do, all, all for it. And then finally, um, the golf classic, which also brings us once a year, some people who learn what our children's hospital is about. But I have to tell you that's friend raising because that goes right child life. Um, our, I didn't even talk about what we stood up this year, which is a pediatric palliative care program that is getting me so many, getting so many accolades um, that we, we can't even believe we existed without it before. That stood up on philanthropy. The child abuse program, our mental health program, we're about to double the size of our adolescent program. I wish I could tell you that the healthcare system was in shape to be able to make all of that happen, but it doesn't. And yet through the reserve, you know, what we've been able to raise through the generosity over 30 years, I'm going into that now to make things happen for kids. Again, with our families saying, this is what we need to do. So we're going to need not just a million dollars a year, but we're going to need major gifts. And we're going to need it because, again, I want to thank if, – if, if we have representation today from the New England Federal Credit Union, thank you. Because you've helped give a very generous gift this year that's going to enable us literally to break some walls down in a NICU that needs to move and be rebuilt. But it's going to buy us a few more years until we can – take care of our building needs because we are basically maxed in terms of what we can do. If you saw our NICU, which was there when Jerry Lucy was there, it has, we get an A for the March of Dimes, but it needs to, it needs space. And NEFCU is going to give us a little more space and I couldn't be happier. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our ED, we have five people doing incredible work down there. We, we are landlocked. And if you're going to build something, our organization is certainly going to provide things, but solidification, the things that make it a child-friendly children's hospital and that allow us to turn this into what it needs to be, that's a major gift. Endowment. Endowment is where gifts are given to departments so that from the interest that's raised, they can put projects and, and let things go and make that happen. 
I will tell you there are only there are 140 pediatric chairs in the country. There are five who have no endowment. I am one of them. I don't need the endowment. But let's face it, on 30 years, sooner or later, this ride is going to end. I don't know. I'm having a great time. But the, what's here? What will be here to continue what Dr. McKay started? Okay. And if it's not for, for this, for all of these different areas, each one of those pictures I was showing you could be an endowment for their program. Right now, we are using philanthropy so much for the third thing. Okay. Those for, for program using reserves that I've accumulated for programs that do not fund themselves. And that's what pediatrics is all about. If you think about what we've accomplished and what I've shared for you, it would not have been possible without philanthropy. So those are the six tenets that shape our department. Okay, national community. We love taking care of kids with the quality focus. The fact that we are walking so much in the area and, and humbled by it of equity, diversity, inclusion, and I pause on social justice, the wellness factor, and then the sustainability that I, again, it's nice when my mid-career faculty walk in my office and say, tell us everything you do so we can pick it up. But they also ask, how can we make philanthropy happen? So let me close with some appreciative gratitude, which is how I always open usually my meetings with our faculty and with our community members, and just tell you that we are exceedingly grateful in our department in Children's Hospital. And we say thank you to the foundation and to all of you listening to this webinar just for being interested. You don't have to hear me today. For listening, understanding, sometimes when there's good news and we do a lot of things, you don't hear this. But we're not out there to get, you know, I'm humbled to get your attention but we're getting this job done at a time when healthcare, as you know, funding is tight. And we're making things happen with results for the children of this state, the country, and the world. And we are thanking, I just thank you for basically being invested in wanting to hear this story and in turn maybe wanting to do more to improve the health of children and the families we serve. Benjamin Mays, who is really a, a founder of the civil rights movement in this country, has a quote that I like that says, we stand on the shoulders of our predecessors who have gone before us. Okay, We as their successors have to catch that torch of freedom and liberty passed on to us by our ancestors. We cannot lose in this battle. So before I close out, I just want to thank the past leaders of this department who are no longer with us, but they continue to be with us. And anyone else who has not passed away, but has been a part of this department and has helped us row upstream and now have passed the oars on to us to do what needs to be done to carry that mission and vision forward. Jim McKay, first chair, Jerry Lucy, second faculty member. You've heard me mention him. Dick Narkowitz, another president. Jim was president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So was Dick, who started the Back to Sleep campaign to reduce sudden infant death syndrome. Paula Duncan, one of three authors who set up that Bright Futures, how we examine children in this country. Also uh, in charge of maternal child health for the state, uh, a pioneer in our VCHIP program. Jim Stackpole, pioneer in school health. The school nurses in the state have an award named for him. Lee Phillips, second. Dean of Education, was on the National Infectious Disease Committee for the Academy, and three champions in neonatology who did so much work with babies of mothers who, who used opioids and really have improved and, and set the stage for Leslie Young to take their discoveries forward. Carrying forward the legacy of these heroes, I believe, falls to all of us those of you who are on the Zoom, and is the reason all of us in this department in Children's Hospital and any of you who want to come in this tent, it is the reason we are not only surviving as a children's hospital and pediatrics department, but why we are thriving. And that is what Dr. McKay hoped would happen when I believe he created something extraordinary in 1950 that continues now 73 years later. And with the help of philanthropy and an incredible group of people that I am so honored and humbled to have the opportunity to work with, um, I hope will continue for at least 73 more. So to wrap up, I leave you with this from our department and University of Vermont Children's Hospital. Using this opportunity to share what we do has hopefully been very helpful so as to make all of you who have attended this webinar cognizant of how important your collaborative and supportive efforts are in enabling all of us here to sustain the gains our department and children's hospital have achieved over the past 73 years, which in turn will help nurture the lives of our youngest patients as we look to the future because they are the future of children's health in this state. So I leave you with that. Look at that. It spells UVMCH, University of Vermont Children's Hospital. Coincidence? I don't think so. Thank you. This is our mascot, Monty the Moose. And I will break the share and have time for discussion, questions, and thoughts. Thank you so much for even listening to what I wanted to share. I hope it gave you a sense of what our university is trying to accomplish for children. Um, just, yes, let's, we'll, we'll, 
will cheer. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. First. That was just so much information. It's overwhelming how much you have achieved in um, 70 years in your 30th um, year. And there can be just no greater cause at all than than nurturing the lives of all children. So I just like, it's just such a wonderful cause. I'm gonna open it up to the participants. Please either put your hand up or if you have a question, write it in the chat, but we'd love to know what's on your mind. And we have, we're lucky enough to have Dr. First for a little while longer, if anybody has any questions for him. People are at a loss for words. <laughs> This is the usual reception I get after I speak. Now, I, I hope I hope this covered some. If there's some areas that you want to hear about that I didn't discuss, I can only do so much in a half an hour um, when you're trying to give you a sampling. I see Dr. Gessner's hand is up and Michelle has her hand up. Why don't, why don't we go Michelle first and then Ira. Michelle? Thank you. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to um, recognize your leadership to this entire team. Um, that you spoke about today, and it, it is um, uh, unbelievable, it is valuable, and is monumental. Um, and so using your acronym, I wanted to recognize your work. Um, you are a tireless advocate um, and, and such a leader uh, that we all strive to uh, follow and be like. So thank you for that. Thank you, Michelle. It means a lot. Wow. Appreciate that. Ira? Yes, that was a remarkable presentation uh, uh, that uh, uh, everyone in pediatrics in the world should hear. I started in pediatrics uh, under Dr. McKay uh, as a medical student in 1904. Uh, what, when did I come here? 1952. Uh, when the department was consisted of Dr. McKay and two practitioners in the community. And then, and I continued uh, in awe of what Vermont acquires has accomplished. My question: the department, you are the linchpin for this department, Doctor First. Uh, you are the keystone, the basis for its uh, leadership uh, in all of you have done. My question: what is in place to assure? that should you no longer be leading the department, that it will continue to do what you are doing? Well, I hope, I mean, I can tell you that everything that I told you, I, if I get run over by a bus today, I have a faculty member who can step in. You know, I'm on several, for example, take, take the media. Um, Doctor, we have about a half dozen of us who have different stations, write for different papers, blog, you get the word out there. In education, um, it's interesting. I, I used to have every medical student would be my advisee. I'm down to two or three, not because I don't know them, but because it's time to pass the buck to make sure other people can do just as good a job advising. Um, in the laboratory, the VCHIP program has changed leadership. Okay, and it's as strong as it has been, thanks to the people that found Judy, Judy Shaw, who founded it. But there, I mean, Heidi Schumacher is here, is now a part, who's a UVM graduate. She's on, and um, she can attest to the fact that there's a new generation in the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program, and it's going strong. The issue of sustainability is that sixth tenet. I tell this to our residents when they come in, they are the future. And I do an elective with them where they can spend a week with me learning how to run the department, Ira. So again, <laughs> You know, I want them to understand what leadership is all about and that it goes beyond, you know, when you, you have to start with that child at the bedside and never forget that. That's why I walk these floors every morning. But then you have to then say, how do we generalize that and keep these kids healthy outside the hospital? And what is the role of a pediatrician today? So I am totally focused on sustainability. And I can go over offline with you each area of that big graph I showed you where and not only that, the idea of term limits allows new people to experience leadership and know how to get in charge. I'll, I'll give you an example. My residency director is not on a term because if I want her to be national, you can't come out after five years, but her associate directors are all on five-year terms, staggered. So they learn how to run the residency. So if again, you know, if for some reason she decides or, and we evaluate everybody that she's not doing the job, I have people who are not gonna say, what are we gonna do now? If those of you who were here before, we've had, we have four cardiologists who were here for 30 years. And they all, if you now look at our cardiology division, I saw Caitlin Haxel is here. 
We have completely transitioned our cardiology division without anybody, you know, getting accolades from the new cardiologist saying, wow. And these cardiologists come to us from some wonderful places around the country to continue to pick up where that left off. So this issue of being national is part of the sustainability. There's a method to this. That's why I showed you those six things, because I, I follow leadership and it can't end. It can't be dependent on, on an individual as much as you say what you said and what Michelle said. It's about everybody. I mean, Dr. Zala is the senior associate dean for medical education. I was once a senior associate dean for medical education. OK, she's got this. OK, I don't even come down and bang on her door except to say hi in the window. But she's running the curriculum now for our medical school. OK, not me. She is doing it. And, I'm, you know, and again, this is what sustainability. But she's a pediatrician. And she still comes and sees kids on our floor on the weekends. Sorry, Chris, I'm doing all this for you. Um, but I just want people to know that I can tell a story about the people who are on this Zoom who are part of that sustainability. Okay, now the goal here is obviously, you know, we talk about endowment and those kinds of things have to be here because that's part of it too. But the people are remarkable. Thank you. That really shut traffic down. Here we have Allie. Oh, Allie. Oh, Hi. First. Thank, thank you so much. I agree. It was an incredible presentation. So uh, very energizing. Could you talk a little bit more about how I'm really thinking of our departments as more network departments and not just not only Burlington based? Could you say a little bit more on how that's impacted the pediatric department? Yeah, I can give you. I'm going to use ours as the example because it's it's working and it does great. Every month, um, pediatricians from Central Vermont Medical Center, from Alice Hyde, from Middlebury, we all get together, and we share everything. So our care pathways, our our educational materials. We actually they they show we've learned so much from the the rural practices of things they're doing to deal with issues of um, issues of um, body image, issues of mental health how they've integrated mental health. So we share and we standardize and we measure. Um, they teach, every site is now there. I am, you know, we're, we're landlord, in terms of placement, I now have my residents want to work in these practices that before would say, I don't wanna leave Burlington. Now, these places are part of us. There is one pediatrician in our network in Malone. She's at every faculty meeting we hold, okay? She said, the dean came out there and said, she feels like she belongs and she's an Incredible what she's doing and what we can learn in Malone, New York. And then we go out and see them. So over time, our specialists through telehealth, not only do we see these kids in their local areas, but we're going to set up satellite clinics where, where we need to for as in the, you know, as we develop this network is there. Plus we have the telehealth cameras in the ICU areas in the nurseries. So we're improving quality, but it's it's all there. And in terms of term limits, the person who's in charge of our nurseries across all those hospitals will come those other hospitals. It doesn't have to be a Burlington production, but everybody feels valued. Every family feels good. And I love going to see them. And they love coming to all of our meetings and feel like we don't use the term anymore, faculty practice and community practice. We talk about partners. And that's what a network department is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, sadly, we have come to our time and we like um, to stay true to our time limits. So um, first of all, let me say, Dr. First, you are truly a gift. You are a gift to the university, to the hospital, to the state of Vermont, and to the world. And, you know, we just we can't thank you enough for your time today, but for all that you do for the children of the world, really. Well, I, I would make the pronoun we. And there's a whole army here of people. I'm not, you know, 100, but I really want to make it clear that when you think about this, it cannot be one person deep. Um, and I can look at a lot of people, Debbie. So I, I, that's a key takeaway in sustainability, that it's ours and it's our children's hospital. And I hope all of you or if you know people and they want to hear more about this, um, we cannot do this without the generosity of all of you in the foundation. And I hope you'll think about sustainability and not just because we're quiet and not, not there in front of you, but we are getting a job done that needs to continue to get done. Sorry, I had to just say it no, again. And what I was going to say to um, the um, to our volunteers, to our, the people who participated today, I can't think of 
a gift that makes a greater impact than children. Um, and that may be, in full disclosure, I'm weeks away from the birth of my first grandchild, so children are definitely on my mind, but I can't think of a better cause um, for you to consider. And um, Dr. First, you couldn't have demonstrated any greater the impact that um, to, to donors of, of what can happen. Um, thank you. Their dollars. So it's a lot. thank you all for your time to the participants. You will receive a follow-up message. We love feedback. We like to hear what's on your mind and how we did so we can improve next time. Or if you have any recommendations for other things you'd like to hear from Dr. First or from anybody, please let us know. And thank you again for being here and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.